Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon to all of our listeners today, and welcome to today's Range 4 webcast. Today we're talking about what is a DevOps test engineer. I'm going to be your speaker today. My name is Helen Beale. I describe myself as a DevOpsologist, that is, I study DevOps all day long. So um, let's move on to the agenda. Um, so I've got three items on the agenda. We're going to look at uh, the subject of the webcast, what is a DevOps test engineer. Um, we're going to review the key principles of DevOps test engineering, and then we'll give you some next steps in terms of learning more and getting DevOps certified. So let's start, as I said, agenda item one, what is a DevOps test engineer? So kind of an apology or kind of a um, little bit of clickbait there in the title. Uh, and I say that because there isn't really such a thing as a DevOps engineer. Um, I've avoided in this webcast doing what we often do, which is kind of talking about the history of DevOps and what DevOps is. And I'm hoping that as I go through the slides, it will become apparent how this all relates together. But this first point is there isn't such a thing as a DevOps test engineer. I like to um, recall something I heard at conference years ago, and I've been saying it to people. I heard someone once say, one day we will all be engineers. And this idea of having a job title and not having a job title is quite a devops -y thing. And the reasons that we don't like job titles in DevOps is because they tend to silo us. They tend to restrict what we do. So they don't really promote cross-skilling and cross-functional teams that we like, but more about that uh, in a moment. So what we prefer are roles and being able to move between roles. So I've been saying for quite a while, I heard someone say at conference once that one day we'll all be engineers. And recently I caught on Twitter, Gene Kim, Kim saying it. So here's a, a screenshot of Gene saying, my actual belief will all be called engineers regardless of DevOps infrastructure, you know, whoever, whoever we are. So it will become this catch-all term. Um, a higher level of maturity of DevOps is actually to, to say that there may be no differentiation between business and IT in the future. We will all just be focused on value outcomes and we'll be value stream focused. And that's really where we're talking about flow. And we'll keep coming back to the concept of flow during this chat. Gene Kim, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is one of the kind of dons of DevOps. He is the one of the co-authors of the Phoenix Project, which is the kind of must-go-to book if you want to know a bit more about DevOps. It is a novel, so it's very fun to read. Lots of people that we talk to about it say, read the Phoenix Project. I'm living the Phoenix Project. It's very true to life. You'll find lots of scenarios in there that you'll be potentially living in now. Um, and it tells the story of a journey. There is a narrative arc, it being a novel that you can follow, and it teaches you all sorts of things around the three ways, which I will refer to again in a few moments, um, and flow and the theory of constraints and things that help us improve the way that we deliver software and higher quality software. Gene is also one of the co-authors of the, the DevOps Handbook, which is around a year old now, and the organizer of the DevOps Enterprise Summit currently running this week in San Francisco. So one of the things we like to say in DevOps is that it's not one person's job, it's everyone's job. This again is one of the reasons that we don't like job titles, as I just said. So one of the other things that job titles make people do is have that, oh, it's not my job kind of moment. And when we talk about things like when work is done, people say things like, well, I've done my bit, whereas actually what we want to understand is that value outcome has been delivered to the customer by the whole team. So DevOps isn't one person's job, it's everyone's job. Um, quite often you'll see organizations putting together DevOps teams, or you might have people with DevOps job titles, and they're kind of dangerous. We need to be careful if we're doing that. If we understand that it's a transitional state to getting everybody in the organization understanding DevOps practices and principles and behaving according to the rules, if you like, that we have in DevOps, and the rules are things like collaborate better, share information effectively, help the flow happen, so don't create constraints, don't create lots of handoffs, don't create bottlenecks through change um, processes or provisioning processes, but help this flow of work and the flow of value outcomes happen. That helps us understand what we're trying to do. So we say that DevOps is not one person's job, it's everyone's job. And we also say that security isn't one person's job, it's everyone's job. And we also say that quality is not one person's job, it's everyone's job. 
So this is the first principle of DevOps test engineering, and I'm now going to switch to that language. So we're not going to talk about DevOps test engineers. We're going to talk about the philosophy, if you like, of DevOps test engineering, what we're trying to do. So this is the first thing, that it's not just the testers that need to be concerned with quality. It's everybody involved in the flow of delivering a value outcome. And that could be the product owner. It could be a project manager if you're still using um, project management and kind of waterfall processes. It is your developers, it's your testers, it's your architects, it's your security people, it's your operations people, it's everybody needs to know that whatever you're putting out there is of a very high quality. So again, reflecting back on this point I've made about us not really like job, job liking job titles because job titles tend to restrict us. Um, you'll probably hear, have already heard of T-shaped people. So what we're trying to do here is get away from silos where we have a bunch of specialists so a team of mq people or a team of dbas or a team of business analysts or a team of architects but actually getting into having these t-shaped people where we've got some specialism but we've also got broad knowledge probably in a couple of areas so for example you could have a developer with some knowledge around testing and some knowledge around security a couple of other levels of this idea that you may not have yet have come across are pie and comb shaped so you could have somebody with very strong deb and test skills for example that also understands how to provision environments and manage storage in the cloud and then building on that even further comb shaped why are people trying to aim for this in terms of cultural capability because it enables us to flow faster because we are more cross-skilled we're able to create more cross-functional teams and we're able to autonomously manage and self-organize work effectively to make things happen so that was our first principle. Our first principle of DevOps test engineering is that quality is everyone's job. Let's look at some other principles around this. So the state of DevOps reports tell us that testing maturity is a differentiator for DevOps maturity. And it's something we see a lot when we work with organizations. So I was, we do a lot of assessments with different companies and we use lots of maturity matrices to try and understand what their current capabilities are and where they want to be and what things they need to do to raise the bar on their activities. And testing is always a big one. Testing automation in particular is one that a lot of organisations we work with have um, a lot of opportunities to grow, should we put it that way. So whilst every organisation is unique, I like to say that there's almost like a, it's like a fingerprint. So we see similar patterns um, coming up every often uh, over and over again so testing is one of these areas uh, where there's typically been quite a large silo and it's quite an interesting one because in some organizations the testing silo resides in development and in other organizations it resides in operations and then lots of organizations may also have a UAT or a user acceptance testing silo that may sit in the business all of these silos are created uh, the way that we have systemically designed things and because we've typically had waterfall processes. And testing becomes increasingly important in waterfall and the evolution to DevOps because the testing people are often the people that feel the most pain. So if you imagine a typical waterfall project happening over many, many months, it's all set out how long it's going to take. There's a period set for development, period set for testing, and a period where it's going to go live. And then typically what will happen is the development overruns scopes change, rework happens, development is delayed, uh, but no one ever moves the live date. The live date always remains the same. So these poor testers sit in the middle and they get horribly squished and it's very, very painful for them. And they're trying to do all this testing and uh, that's uh, all very nasty. So quite often when we see a DevOps engagement, it starts with the testers feeling that pain in the waterfall environment. So the first principle of DevOps that we're trying to implement when we're thinking about test engineering in particular, and this is why it's a specialist subject, if you like, within the DevOps remit, is the concept of little and often. So this is basically agile. Agile says, let's, instead of doing these huge, big development phases and huge, big test phases, let's do much, much smaller phases. So agile is often associated with doing things faster and the intention is that we'll be able to deliver change faster. So uh, when people say they don't understand the difference between Agile and Waterfall, for example, I say it's quite simple. Imagine you've got 100 features and you've got six months. In Waterfall, you're going to deliver 100 features at the end of six months. With Agile, you're going to deliver eight features every two weeks. So you are seeing those features more quickly. 
The other idea with Agile is that we're going to be able to deliver more features because we're getting more right. So actually that number of eight per sprint of two weeks may go up. So you may end up delivering 120 features or 140 features at the end of that six month period by doing it in these small chunks, doing it little and often. The reason that works is because we're basically shortening the feedback loops. So when I mentioned the three ways earlier as part of the underpinning principles of the Phoenix project, this is the second way. The second way is about amplifying feedback loops. So rather than going away for months on end with our requirements document, many, many pages in Word, and then coming back to the business and going, ta-da, there's that thing. And I'm going, oh, I didn't quite mean that. And actually, this has changed since we thought about that or we've learned this. We're interacting with them, ideally, with Agile on a daily basis, although not many organisations manage to, to get that practice yet. But that's probably another subject not to be covered today on the, the webcast. But the whole business IT integration is certainly a challenge often when it comes to Agile. Um, but what we're really trying to do is get these feedback loops from the business much more frequently. The other thing we're trying to do with DevOps test engineering is test earlier. So we're not having a big testing phase at the end. We're doing the testing in the sprint, ideally. We already know there are many, many studies that show that if you pick up a defect in production, it will cost you a lot more in terms of time, money, effort, energy, outages, many, many different ways of looking at it. It will cost you a lot more than were you to find that defect early on in the process. Um, by combining test and development capability in an agile team, so having this cross-functional team that are working closely together on features, we improve the flow of work. And that's the first way, it's all about flow. And that enables us to deliver value outcomes much faster. By having a team of people ideally co-located that are cross-functional, all working together on a particular feature or a set of features or a product, um, or a value stream, we reduce the number of handoffs. And handoffs is where a huge amount of waste happens and where a lot of rework occurs. So this little and often is the basis of everything that we're really trying to do um, in DevOps um, from a kind of functional perspective. If we have things like a product backlog and we have a product owner who has good business representation, then we shouldn't end up with any defects that are actually poorly defined requirements. So if we manage our product backlog correctly, that helps us deliver much better quality software in the, the long term. The other thing from a technical perspective we're often trying to do um, when we're doing Agile is continuous integration. And the definitions of continuous integration demand that we do things like unit tests, integration tests, and UAT every time we check in code to branch um, and, and upload it to master. So we should be doing this every single day. CI is a daily check into trunk or master. So these things help us build quality in by doing it little and often. Now there is a bit of a, a challenge here for some of the, the larger older customers that we work with uh, in terms of what we call legacy systems, which is a really big kind of catch-all term for older stuff. And when we say legacy and older stuff, what we often mean is applications that have been either architected in a certain way or have grown into some kind of sprawling spaghetti, uh, you might say mess, you might say uh, monolith with lots of dependencies. If we have a monolithic application with lots of dependencies, it's quite hard for us just to take a small part of it and do a little and often. It's quite hard for us just to run a small test on a small bit of it. So um, again, topic for another day. In fact, if you look on our YouTube channel, you'll find previous webcasts we've done tackling the subject of legacy applications. But one of the things that you might need to think about is either re-architecting applications or eroding them using things like microservices or the little and often principles to break an app down into smaller bits. So let's move on to the next key principle, which is shifting left. So I've touched on this already. Um, I've said already that we know there are many, many studies that tell us that the earlier we find a defect, the cheaper and easier it is to fix it. So rather than having testing as a separate process coming later on in a cycle, we need to be doing testing in small bits earlier alongside development. We can take that further. Um, we can do things like using a, a design principle or like test-driven development, for example, or TDD. So TDD enables us to do things or our developers to do things that make them build quality in. So it's really moving away 
from ship then fix and thinking about fix then ship. So making sure that whatever goes out of the door or into production is of the highest quality we can manage within that time scale and the resources that we have. So test-driven development basically means that the developers will be writing the test before they write any code. So they write the test, test the test against the code and it will fail because they haven't written the code and then they can start writing the code. So it's really changing the mindset to focus on whether things are working in the way that they are defined rather than just delivering what is defined. So we want to test early, um, we want to shift left, we want to do this continuously as well. So you'll hear continuous a lot in the world of DevOps. We hear it so much that last year we ran a survey called How Continuous Is Your DevOps? and then followed that up by presenting the findings in various platforms as um, DevOps and all the continuouses. So um, forgive us for um, you know, messing up the English language there, but there was a level, slight level of frustration from us because we talk about continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, continuous testing, continuous improvement, continuous funding, continuous learning. There were just so many continuouses. But really, this is what we're, we're saying in everything in DevOps, it's back to little and often. We're doing things to deliver value outcomes all the time. So the next principle that I wanted to cover was really around failure. And in, in DevOps, we love failure. And this comes as a surprise to lots of organizations because failure has so many negative connotations. As we all understand, we can cause massive problems if something fails. So probably take a step back and explain why we love failure so much in DevOps. Because if we're not experimenting and not trying to innovate, we won't be failing. So failure becomes a signifier that we are experimenting. And very advanced companies, and we've seen this at, at the likes of Lego, Etsy, Procter & Gamble, will reward failure. So they'll have um, specific reward programs that hold up a project that was particularly ambitious in its scope, and it may not have achieved what it set out to do, but at least it showed that the people within it uh, had courage. And courage is hard to have if you work in a culture where it's kind of pathological and messengers get shot and bad news isn't received well and there is a blame culture and people are looking for people to punish and there is a fear culture. So um, to really allow for this key principle to work, we really do have to tackle the roots of what is going on at a cultural and behavioural level. So I say culture and behavioural because we can't change culture, we can only change behaviour. Culture is kind of the symptom, if you like, of the causes of all the behaviours within an organisation. So TDD, the example from the, the previous key principle, is a good way of helping us change behaviour. So it changes behaviour from developers just thinking their job is just to code something to thinking that actually they had, do have a responsibility and accountability for the quality of that and helping them uh, change the way that they work in order to ensure that that is built in. So we love failure because it's an indicator that we are experimenting um, and we are innovating. We have to treat it as a learning opportunity. So you'll hear people talk about the Andon cord at Toyota and when people pulled this cord to stop the line if something was broken, rather than people rushing over and going, what's wrong, what's happened, oh my God, they would actually kind of walk over and the first thing they would do is thank the person for a learning opportunity. Um, this is a key principle of Agile as well, is that if something goes wrong in an Agile team, we don't spend any time wondering who did it. Um, the team as a group has a look at what happened, treats it as a learning opportunity, runs a retrospective and makes some changes. So why is innovation so important to us? Well, because we live in a highly disruptive, digitized environment, it's easier than ever for your competitors to copy what you're doing or think of new ways of doing what you do better and beat you. So if you can't innovate and you can't keep up and experiment um, at the rate that your competitors do, there's a chance that your future may be um, not looking as bright as it could be. So that all sounds great. Um, for a lot of organisations though, life's pretty hard, uh, particularly in older organisations. A lot of time is spent already trying to keep systems up and running that are fragile, sophisticated. I mentioned spaghetti code earlier on and dependencies. Quite often these systems are um, a little you know, a little bit difficult to keep up and running. So in these environments, when we talk about experimentation, experimentation, by the way, is the third way of the three ways that underpin 
DevOps and the Phoenix Project, just to remind you the first way is flow, the second way is feedback loops, and third way is flow. Um, sorry, the third way is experimentation. Some people don't get to experimentation because they're so busy firefighting because they've got so much technical debt and then they're trying to handle all of the change that the business is putting through that actually having any time to experiment is quite hard you may have heard of the google 20 percent time so google put aside 20 percent of the engineer's time to do experimentation and this is a maturity goal that we work towards with many organizations to to make the space for people to be able to experiment and learn and what we have to do in order to be able to do that is we have to stabilise technical debt. So we have to throttle change in order to build systems in that allow us to um, improve upon technical debt and automate things to make things better. So in addition to all of this, if we are going to be then experimenting with systems in a way that could potentially break them, we need to protect the people and the systems from problems that may occur. So you'll probably have heard terms like fail fast, fail early, fail often previously. We also like fail smart. So fail smart um, allows us to preempt failure and know when something's going to happen. So we can build systems to protect ourselves. And this is really important if we want to change the behavior of people away from blame and fear and punishment to courage and experimentation. So if we have systems to protect us, that will help people feel less fearful. If something goes wrong, it's easy to recover from. So there are systems like uh, automated deployment systems that allow us to redeploy last known good state almost instantly if we should um, run into a problem. There are systems like application performance management systems that will give us early warnings of failure when they see um, a performance degradation or something happening. There are ways to um, test our resilience. So you'll probably have heard of Netflix's Chaos Monkey, which is a way that we can um, test our ability to recover from a problem. Um, again, for less kind of DevOps mature companies that perhaps have lots of technical debt and legacy systems, this is a hard one to psychologically get our head around. It's like we're having enough trouble keeping the stuff up without purposefully breaking it. Um, but again, it's a level of maturity that we want to get to, that we've got the space and the time to test our own resilience. I often talk about pilots here. So pilots spend a lot of their career in the simulator, simulating uh, engine failures, system failures, navigation failures, weather patterns, all sorts of things that they might experience in real life so that um, were they to occur in real life, they are prepared. And that's what we're trying to do with these kind of proactive breaking your own stuff systems. From a very specific testing perspective, there are things that we can engineer in that enable us to um, protect ourselves from failure as well. So things like feature toggles, so um, enabling us just to switch on one bit for one group of people and see if that works and switch it off if it doesn't. Things like a canary test, so being able to put um, a particular new feature out, again, to a small group of people and see if the system fails or not. So canary test comes from the concept of having a canary in the in a mine and if there is um, noxious gases then the canary will fail sadly uh, before the humans do. We can also do things like blue green environments very very popular in, in the DevOps world so we're running one of the blue green environments is live and the other one is test and when we're happy that the other one is, is nice and stable fully tested um, working we simply reroute the traffic and the other one um, becomes now our test server. These kind of advanced test architectural strategies are quite important when we have conversations about things like production, like test environments. Again, for the older, more legacy companies that we work with, having a production like test environment is often uh, almost like a mythical unicorn, having this thing that looks exactly the same. It could be very expensive to set up from a physical infrastructure point of view. They could just not have the processes available or the people available to, to make that kind of thing happen. And it's the kind of um, scenario that technology can really help us with. So sometimes having the production like test environment is, is limited or constrained by our ability to replicate integration. So using service virtualization techniques, we can do things like super stubbing, which allows us to um, replicate things like Swift and various other integrations that you may have. Um, that then give us a production like test environment or a more popular one as well these days is using cloud so in cloud is very quick to spin up and down environments so it becomes much easier to 
um, look at uh, getting a production light test environment up and running. So that was the key principle about embracing failure. And I've just touched on quite a few things around automation. I've talked about deployment automation and uh, monitoring systems. I've talked about these various different um, testing models like feature toggling and canary testing in blue green and having production like test environments that all help us engineer quality in early and protect ourselves from failure. Um, but we can also automate a lot of tests. So you can look at different models that show you how much time is saved by automating tests overall. But the key thing to think about is if you save that time, what are you going to do with it? So if you spend three weeks automating a test that normally takes three weeks to run and now it takes 10 minutes, how many more tests can you run in that time that you've now saved? How much more value can you deliver as a team now that you're not spending so much time testing? How much more of your time as a team can you now dedicate to innovating? And this is what we're really talking about when we do DevOps investment cases. In the old style IT world, we used to spend a lot of time writing business cases about productivity and resource savings. Really now in DevOps, what our primary concern is about injecting capacity into the system so that we can deliver more value outcomes. So making things more reliable, more consistent and automating the things that we can. But it's very important we prioritize carefully. There's no point automating a test that you run once a year, even if it takes six weeks you know though we need to balance out um, what the priorities are in terms of automating and we need to automate them at every point in our cd pipeline so as we go through our route live we need to run a test and get a feedback loop on it at every point so when your developer checks in code run the tests if it passes it gets to go to the next page stage in the ci pipeline if it passes there um, if, as it goes to continuous delivery, as it goes to pre-production and it goes into live, you can be confident about that code's capability of working and you not having loads of defects coming out at the other end. And finally, the last key principle I wanted to mention is about celebrating success. So when you have automated 60% of your tests and made 30% of your team's time available to deliver more features and you've incre increased your velocity from x number of story points per sprint to y number of story points per sprint we need to celebrate this we need to tell people about it we need to have that data so we need to be able to measure measurement is another very key part of what we do when we do devops so it enables us to build trust and trust is another key indicator of a high performing it organization and a high performing it organization is an indicator of a high performing organization from a profitability productivity and market share point of view so we must celebrate success we must have the data that allows us to provide proof and evidence and that allows us to build trust moving forward because this allows us to do more so in summary and what I've done there is basically give you a 30 minute overview of what a two day course that I'm going to tell you a bit more about in a moment um, is. That's a 30 minute overview. These are the key principles. So quality is everyone's job. It's not just for the testers. The testers are the specialists with specialist knowledge about how testing works. And if you're a manual tester, I highly recommend that you spend some time learning more about automating tests. And this is your job in terms of moving towards development capabilities. We're asking the developers to become more test oriented. We're asking testers to become more development oriented and understand how to automate tests, how to write scripts um, and how to make themselves and the process more efficient. We want things to happen little and often. We want small batch, we want continuous testing, we want small features that allow us to look at things independently uh, or in a microservices manner. We want to test as early as we possibly can and as often as we can. So we want to shift left. We want to think about that quality from the moment we're thinking about coding or before. This is test-driven development. Um, this is automating testing at the moment that a developer checks in code. We want to create an environment where we can embrace failure, we can have courage to experiment, and we are protected from creating catastrophic failure of the business systems. We want to prioritize and automate um, and the, there is a bit of a DevOps myth, myth, automate everything. We don't want to automate everything. We want to automate what we call the rote tasks. So the um, tasks that are re repeated often um, and are very manual uh, and have a high propensity to go wrong and cause problems. And we want to celebrate success in order to build trust. 
Um, having trust creates less friction, it creates more autonomy, it creates better flow. Um, that's the first way again, flow. So uh, to finish off with section three about getting DevOps certified, we do have this course, the DevOps Test Engineering course. Uh, you'll notice on the right hand side a big long list of people that are in the intended audience. Um, and you know, testers are on there, but it's not just for testers, it really is for everybody. So we have a DevOps Foundation course as well, um, also a two-day course where we talk about things like the DevOps principles I've just discussed, like the three ways, and we look at CALM, so culture automation, lean measurement sharing in great detail. We spend a lot of time exploring uh, tool chain models, so looking at DevOps tool chains, understanding what CI, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment look like reviewing what other organizations have done to make change, looking at organizational models um, and things like Agile and Scrum. Um, and that is our DevOps Foundation course. And this is a, an extension course, if you like, the DevOps Test Engineering course. So it's a, another two-day course that we spend two days exploring in detail some of the things that I've described at a high level here. Um, so the vocabulary of DevOps testing, why DevOps testing is different from other types of testing so hopefully you've got a feel for that today uh, the differences are mainly that we're doing it a lot earlier a lot more continuously and we're expecting everybody to have an eye on quality not just the testing department then we have the review of the various different test strategies so I've covered a few of them today so um, talking about how we fit testing into these different uh, workflows when we talk about continuous integration, continuous delivery, how we can use things like feature toggling and canary tests in blue green and production like test environments to ensure that whatever we output is of the highest possible quality. And then finally, how DevOps testers fit with the DevOps culture organization roles. So that C in CALMS, the cultural piece. So the next public DevOps test engineer course is in London in April next year. Sounds like quite a long time away, but uh, we you can have one anytime you like on site. We need a minimum of five people in order to be able to do uh, one wherever you like it in the world. Just ask for our expenses to be covered. Um, you do, however, need to do the DevOps Foundation course before you can do the DevOps Test Engineer course and attain the certification for that one. Uh, we do have that available online. You can do it in either 30 or 60 days. And uh, we have two upcoming public schedule courses for the DevOps Foundation course, one in mid-December, 13th to 14th December this year, and one early next year in February uh, 5th and 6th that would give you time then to set certification either in class or using an exam voucher and then be ready for the test engineer course in April. Uh, again, we can do a DevOps Foundation course whenever you like on site. Uh, again, a minimum of five students to make that happen. So uh, we do have special offer running at the moment. So we're doing a bundle of the DevOps Foundation course and the DevOps Test Engineer course for public schedule. So the normal per student price for each of those two day courses is £2,400. So There's a 20% discount if you buy both courses together. So we uh, are charging £1,920 and we'll send you some links in the follow-up email for more information on that. So I now have some time for some questions. If you have any, please put them in the question box or in the chat box is also fine. We have a few moments to take questions uh, until we are finished today. So I have one question that's just come through. Um, so what would the three biggest benefits of DevOps testing be? So the first one is about delivering more value outcomes. Um, and that's a long winded way, perhaps, of saying making more money faster. Um, when we say value outcomes, we can measure that in different ways. So we have some customers, for example, who are using things like AI to integrate with uh, Alexa, so Echoes and querying Alexa on conversion rates on their website. So that's how they're measuring value, a real business um, perspective that is telling them how much money they're making. Uh, you could also use a customer retention or customer satisfaction. So you could use things like Net Promoter Score or NPS to understand the impact of uh, what you're delivering. So we'll say number one 
is, deliver, is improving flow, so getting better value outcomes faster. Um, we'll say number two is customer satisfaction, and that's really from two ways. One, as I've just described, in terms of delivering more features better, and then the other would be from not giving them stuff that doesn't work very well, so having higher quality uh, outputs there. And then the third one, I think, is a saving around uh, not having to fix stuff later, so automating um, as much as you can. So you are not spending um, so much time doing manual testing that you are able to automate lots of testing and uh, you're able to not have uh, those defects going into production and costing you a lot of money there. So uh, that was my first question. I have a, another question here. So what's best in class release cycle time in DevOps? Every two weeks, four weeks, etc. So that's a great question. Thanks, Mike. Um, so broadly speaking, in agile terms, and if we think of agile as one of the underpinning concepts of, of DevOps, and for the sake of argument today, we're going to say the other two are ITSM and Lean. Um, if we take agile, there's kind of two ways of delivering features in an agile way, if you like. One would be to use Scrum, which is now the most commonly used agile framework, and the other is to use something like Kanban and have a more continuous delivery approach. So if we take the first one, Scrum. Um, easy to learn, difficult to master. In Scrum, they suggest sprints of four to two weeks. And I say four to two because a lot of people like to, if they're moving from waterfalls, to start with four weeks because that's a new thing and work their way down. Um, some of you are probably thinking, well, can you do three then? And you, you can, but where we tend to see people using three weeks is they're normally doing things like doing a two-week development sprint and then having a week of UAT, which, as I hope you appreciate from what I've already said today, is not... Um, an ideal pattern or an ideal process that is still having a silo. Um, it's something we'd often refer to as Wagile um, or Waterfall, a cross between Waterfall or Agile. So in Scrum, most what most people are aiming for really is a two-week cycle. Um, it might seem obvious to run that Monday to kind of the following but one Friday. Actually, most people would want to start it midweek so they're not always getting um, towards the end of a a scrum at, or at the end of a sprint at the end of the week where you know people may be working from home and things like that sometimes makes more sense to end a sprint uh, midweek. I also mentioned Kanban or continuous delivery so Kanban works slightly differently they both have um, boards so you can have a scrum board uh, in scrum and you can have a Kanban board in Kanban they look quite similar they've got columns where um, you put where the task is and you can run them either physically uh, or you can run them virtually in something like Jira. Um, and with Kanban, rather than sitting down at the start of the sprint and having a sprint planning session where you get uh, a sprint backlog, which is the subset of the product backlog of work that you're going to do in that sprint, uh, with Kanban, it is continuous. So work is continually pulled across the board according to uh, demand. That's not to say in Kanban you can't do things that you are able to do in scrums so in scrum one of the artifacts that we have is the burn down chart so at any point in the sprint you should be able to say uh, where you are in the sprint against what was planned at the start so it shows you if you're on target for completing the features you set out or the story points that you set out to do at the start of the sprint uh, with kanban you can measure velocity or some people prefer to use the word throughput and you can choose when you're going to do that so <clears throat> the way that Kanban works is we have uh, basic whip limits or work in progress limits on the columns and that enables us to, to manage the work through, um, which gives us some visual collaboration. So that was a very long answer to quite a short question. Um, two week sprints in Scrum is the most popular option, but not the only one is the short answer to that question. So I have uh, another few questions coming up, if you just bear with me. Um, how does DevOps testing integrate into continuous integration and continuous delivery workflows? So if we take continuous integration, first of all, when a developer, um, so continuous integration demands that developers check in code at least one daily, once daily into uh, a CI server. So every time they check in, tests should be run. Interestingly, in the DevOps Foundation course, we spent quite a lot of time talking about this, and the definition from Jess Humble's continuous delivery book says that in CI, in continuous integration, we should be testing, uh, we should be doing unit tests, integration tests, and UAT. 
Um, it's quite rare for us to meet an organisation that is doing CI and doing all three of those tests. Almost everybody will be doing a unit test using any unit or J unit, depending on what flavour of code you're producing. Um, but fewer perform the integration test and certainly the UAT test at that point. Um, in continuous delivery, that's often the, the kind of next level we see more of these tests coming in. Um, sometimes the difference between continuous integration and continuous delivery is defined as just the different servers. So you may have a CI server and then you've got a next stage server, which is your continuous delivery server, which is more production ready. Hopefully that answered that one. Uh, another one question here. Do you have Scrum Masters in DevOps? So, um, great question. Thanks, Siobhan. Again, a bit similar to Mike's question, actually, because it's kind of, if we say DevOps is uh, the harmonious polygamous marriage of Agile, Lean and ITSM and DevOps is the, the the love child, if you like, of that harmonious polygamous marriage. Really, this is a, an Agile question, primarily from the development angle, first of all. So a Scrum Master role is a, um, is a Scrum role, obviously. It's kind of clues in the name. And in Agile, we would want one of them. So the Scrum Master's role in Agile is to remove impediments basically for the team so in the daily stand-up the team you'd go around the team and say what did you do yesterday what are you doing today what are you doing um, what impediments do you have and the scrum master's role is then to go away and remove all of these obstacles they have other roles as well so they have a role to work closely with the product owner they have a role to help coach the business in terms of why are just happening and what's expected of them um, so if you're doing scrum we would expect you to have a scrum master you can do DevOps without doing Agile, but you're going to find it harder because Agile helps drive the little and often behavior that we want to see in DevOps that allows us to do things like automate um, early and often. You also may choose a slightly different Agile model. So as I said, Scrum is the most popular Agile framework out there. Um, you may look at the Spotify model um, or uh, you may be a bit more Kanban oriented. So you may choose not to have that role. So again, quite a, a long answer. In fact, I'm just going to lengthen it a little bit more um, because I didn't mention the ops side of this. So a lot of people say that DevOps has come about because software developers have gone agile and IT operations weren't able to keep up and didn't really know what they were doing. So if that's the case, then we need to do some work to understand how IT operations can become more agile and understand more about what's happening in the software development space. So we can do things like help IT operations people transition from traditional kind of ITSM waterfall processes and treat service management in a more agile manner. So there's an equivalent role to a scrum master, which is an agile service manager, which is a, a role we can train IT operations people have to have so that they can use techniques like scrum to deliver services and design services and tweak services in a much more uh, agile manner. So a uh, slightly longer answer there. Agile is a big subject. Um, we do a lot of agile coaching um, to help people answer some questions like that. So we've got a few more questions coming up. Um, if teams can't spin up or tear down pro production-like environments at will and have dependency on external infrastructure teams, are you not DevOps, even if you have CI, CD, automation set up? Oh, so it's quite a long question. So let me just try and break it up a little bit. Um, are we kind of saying if you've got CI, CD automation, you're DevOps? Because that's kind of not the case. So this is where some of the confusion comes in, actually, around this term continuous delivery. And um, I mentioned Jess Humble as the author of the continuous delivery book um, a few moments ago. And actually, there's co-author, Dave Farley, um, who was at a roundtable I was at recently. And we had a discussion where he was saying continuous delivery is a much better word for DevOps than DevOps. And I challenge that because I think a lot of people, when they say continuous delivery, mean the automation at that level rather than the continuous delivery of value outcomes. If you refer back to the original Agile Manifesto, when it talks about continuous delivery, it's talking about um, continuous delivery of outcomes to the customer. So, um, Having CI/CD automation doesn't necessarily equal DevOps. Um, brings us to a much larger question, really, which is um, what is DevOps and what is what does DevOps look like when it's done? So 
where DevOps started as a methodology to help development and operations people collaborate more effectively, it's become a much broader, wider thing that now considers the whole value stream of delivering software faster and more, um, more safely and better, being the, the quality part of it. So it's going to be a very long answer to this question, but we have lots of maturity matrices that help people understand different levels of DevOps um, DevOps capability, for example. So there's one one particular matrices that we have, um, which is our CALMS matrix. So I've mentioned cultural automation, lean metrics and sharing as a, a framework that we use to describe what DevOps is. So you could be doing CI and CD in one team, but your organization could not be very mature culturally. So I've mentioned cultural immaturity in terms of having a blame and having fear and not being able to experiment. Um, you might have a bit of continuous integration going on, but people aren't able to uh, deliver value outcomes because, or not able to experiment because that fear is still there. So a very long and not even comprehensive answer to what was quite a long question. Um, you can, you are, dev, you are doing an element of DevOps if you have C, CICD, but it's a very small part of it. Automation is a very small part of it. Um, if you can't spin up or tear down production-like environments, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not DevOps, but if you haven't got a production-like test environment, it's going to make it harder um, for you to do good testing. If you have dependency on external infrastructure teams, you need to stop thinking about them as external infrastructure teams and start thinking of them as part of a value stream. And I appreciate that's difficult, when they're SIs and they are contracted and someone else in procurement is doing an annual or biannual uh, contract negotiation. But this is something we can help with by doing things like value stream mapping um, exercises to understand what that flow of work looks like. And that's a, a classic legacy challenge, that one. I'm going to move on to the next question. How do you organise your team with the use of line managers? What's the alternative? I believe in Scrum. They suggest your line manager lies outside of the Scrum team. Is it as simple as this in DevOps also? So, again, what we're really talking about here is what's the relationship between Agile and Scrum and what's the relationship between Agile and DevOps? So, Organisationally, we've got lots of habits and understanding that are so ingrained in all of us in the way that we've worked for a long time. We really have to ask ourselves what the role of a line manager is. What are they there to do? So with DevOps and Agile and most more modern ways of thinking about organisational structure and capability, what we're often talking about is flattening hierarchies. And by that, I mean distributing authority. So the management layers that we may be used to working with may not be um, there in the traditional sense that we understand them to be. Managers may have a slightly different role. So managers may become more um, around doing servant leader roles uh, or even transformational leadership roles. If you read the latest State of DevOps report 2017, you'll see there's another key indicator of organizational success, which is around transformational leadership capability. So I'm kind of not answering your question straight on, but what I would say is there's a big conversation to be had there about what the purpose is of a line manager um, and what the organisational structure needs to look like. In Scrum, the idea is that everybody in the team is equal. Uh, what we often see are patterns where there are things like lead developers, because the reality is that um, in a team, you may have four or five developers of slightly different uh, expertise and maturity experience levels um, so it makes sense to have somebody um, that they can call on if they have a question um, it's not always peer-to-peer -peer. Um, that's a, a fairly large question from an organizational maturity and uh, model perspective so I've slightly run out of time I've answered um, the questions so thank you everyone for uh, lots of questions today and thank you for your attention to the webcast um, and we'll be following up with an email shortly, uh, which will give you the links you'll need to book any courses or ask any questions that you may have. So thank you all very much for your attention. And I look forward to speaking with you soon. Bye for now.